Welcome to our A&E track today for um, government contracting and Port of Seattle and the Small Business Transportation Resource Center. Uh, my name is Leslie Miller and we would like to uh, introduce our uh, staff here. We have Marnie Tyson from Washington PTAC. We also have uh, Lily Johnson from um, Virtual by Heather. We have Andrew Miller here, um, assisting Washington PTAC. And we have Aisha Kadri, who is the uh, program director for the Small Business Transportation Resource Center. <clears throat> and with that, um, I think that we will probably um, go ahead and get started in a moment. Uh, please be sure to update your profile name and um, you know, make sure that you are muted and we will move forward on, on the first presentation. Um, today, we're gonna kinda uh, change things around just a little bit. We are going to uh, um, have two uh, speakers in the first session and then at 2.35, we'll have another speaker after you know, in the regular time slot. But um, before we do that, we do want to thank the Port of Seattle, SBTRC and Washington PTAC for pulling all of this together and making it available. So I am going to um, go ahead and um, uh, open up the, the slideshow. And oops, sorry. All right, I'm gonna share my screen because I am actually your first presenter today. So the idea is to give you a reality check on anything having to do with government contracting. So this is presented um, through Washington PTAC. And we are maybe good to go. Okay, all right. So when you want to do government contracting, the first thing that you need to, to think about are all of the who, what, when, where, why, and how in all aspects of government contracting. The second most important thing that you need to do is understand um, that PTAC, which is the Procurement Technical Assistance Center, is here to give you a hand and kind of walk you through the, the process. Um, and lastly, you really need to be organized. And it doesn't matter if you're doing local, city, county, state, federal contracting, um, you'll need to have some kind of a checklist. So for your company, you have to realize that, that the key to this is that every single aspect of your company is involved in government contracting, um, legal and accounting, technology, human resources, sales and marketing, and production and service. So uh, we're gonna go through each one of these a little bit today so that, that you can kind of get an overview or a feel as to how these are involved in your pursuit of government contracting. So let's start first with legal and accounting. So if you have not started your business, before you even, you know, sign anything, you need to do your homework. You need to have really good legal and accounting counsel. Um, if you are a proprietor, we strongly recommend that you get a federal tax identification number. Do not use your social security number for any government agency as a proprietor. And actually the IRS really does provide a, a very quick and simple online process to, to get your TIN number. 
and it's about a, a 10 minute thing, you know, from start to finish. And at the very end, you will have a document you can print out with your federal tax ID number on it. Um, you know, do you know what the difference is between uh, an LLC, an LLP, uh, an S Corp, a, a C Corp? And, and if you don't know, you really need to talk to both legal and accounting to see how this will impact not only your liability, but uh, your tax considerations also. So let's talk about accounting. Um, PTAC highly recommends that you develop a business plan and the idea on this is so that you will have a comprehensive view of everything that it's gonna to take to make your company successful. Um, something like cash flow projections. You know, well, how much money do you think you're gonna make in a month? And how, how much money um, do you think your expenses will be every month? Are you seasonal? Yeah, you know, what if something like COVID hits? You know, it, it, uh, there's a lot of things to take into consideration. And so by having your cash flow projections, that will really help you understand, you know, the ups and downs throughout a typical season. And the other thing it'll, it'll help you understand is the need for capital investment. You know, starting off on a shoestring or in your garage is, you know, nice in theory, but the reality may come back and be an issue with you, you know, if you don't have enough money to pay the rent because you've had to be closed for COVID. So um, the business plan is critical. The other thing is QuickBooks, which is what so many smaller companies are using is not necessarily the accounting software that you will need if you do federal contracting because there are required reports and uh, statements that need to be submitted and uh, you'll need a higher level of accounting software. So what is WAWF? That is wide area workflow and um, the uh, Department of Defense uses wide area workflow. That is an online billing system for you to send your bills to the federal government. And everything is uh, electronic funds transferring. But the thing is your accounting department needs to know how to function in the wide area workflow process. Um, and then let's talk about cost accounting. This is not your accounting 363 class that you took in college. Um, when it comes to direct and indirect costs, um, it's more than just the standard uh, generally accepted accounting principles. The federal government applies to FAR 31 to delineate how you um, can allocate your costs on the um, production side of, of your materials. So moving on, let's um, say you want to do business in Washington state. And I have a link on here um, to open a business. But before you can do that, you will need to have your federal tax ID number. And after you have gotten that, then you can register with the Secretary of State if you're a corporation. And just a note, proprietors are not required to register with the Secretary of State, but all corporations and charities are, um, including LLCs and LLPs. You have to register with the Department of Revenue, and this is where your universal business indicator UBI number is generated. Pay attention to licensing requirements and employee issues. So the first time you have an employee that generates an interest by the Washington State 
Employment Security Office and the Washington State Department of Labor and Industries. Um, know what the city and county licensing um, information is, where you can get it. You know, if you're set up to do business in King County and uh, you never go outside of that parameter, you know, that's good. But if you decide that you want to expand to an east side office in Spokane, you have to know and understand the regulations for both city and, and county entities. And then uh, lastly, uh, let's not forget the insurance and bonding. And of all things to consider, you know, liability is kind of like a big topic, particularly when it comes to dealing with the federal government. So you'll want to be sure to, to have insurance and bonding appropriate for your industry and the project. Okay, let's talk about technology. You know, the days are gone where everything was done by hand on paper. And if you have borderline skills, you really need to hire somebody who has high level skills or you need to take classes to get up to speed on this. The other thing is high speed internet. I used to have um, clients in uh, North Central Washington State and their big, biggest obstacle for government contracting was lack of high speed internet. And when you're, you know, up and down I-5, you know, a lot of, of companies take that for granted. But if you were to open an office in um, one of the rural counties, um, you may not have that option for um, high speed at all. Um, also, you need to get a real email address. Um, the federal government in particular will not let like Gmail accounts, Hotmail, Yahoo accounts get through their firewalls. So it, it's really important that um, you have your own domain name and then set up a series of emails in there, you know, like government sales at mycompany.com. Um, and, you know, so you have a more professional look about your company, even though you're really small, that, you know, it'll still look like, you know, you're not necessarily a, a one person entity. Um, other things, keep your antivirus updated, understand zipping and unzipping files in the cloud, watch your spam filters, check your email daily. And I know that this is an issue, particularly with a lot of the younger generation that use text messaging or instant messages. You know, they're not necessarily so enamored with email, but the federal government still uses email and they still use fax machines. So um, if you are gonna go down that road, you know, you just have to uh, accept that fact that, you know, those are the only ways that you're gonna get information back and forth from the federal government. And if you have anything to do with information technology, um, the Cybersecurity Maturity Model Certification, CMMC certification, um, is really a hot topic right now, and it's up and coming as far as requirements go. If you need more information, Washington PTAC can give you a hand on that. Okay, HR issues. So, First thing you're going to need is an employee handbook. Well, I'm just a small company. I only have one or two employees. Well, if you're going to do government contracting, you will need an employee handbook because you need an affirmative action policy in that handbook. And everyone that you hire who will be working on any kind of contracts will be subject to being uh, scrutinized by the agency. Um, know what debarred means, and I put the little definition in there, 
it means that you're blacklisted. And um, if you are blacklisted at the federal level, that will trickle down to state and um, you know local agencies. So um, anybody that's defrauded the federal government, be it an individual or a company, will be on this uh, excluded parties list system. And you can find that information on sam.gov. Anybody who signs your contract, the CEO, the CFO, um, you know, the project manager, you need to do um, look to see if they're on that list. And when it says file not found, that's good. You print that off and you put that in the HR folder. Um, if you have felons that you work with, um, it, you know, it's okay to hire felons to do your work, but if they are going to be performing anything on federal property, um, you will need to submit their criminal records and their fingerprints um, so that they can get authorization to go on to military installations or federal buildings. Um, and it it's, would be a good protocol for your company anyway to maintain this information on anybody who is a known felon. And then lastly on here, you know, you want to get um, certified as a hub zone, which is a historically underutilized business zone company. And this is based on geography. And in order to qualify for this, your company has to be located in a hub zone and 35% of your employees have to live in a hub zone, not necessarily the same one. But what that really means is that the HR department will be busy kind of bird dogging this information throughout the year to see who's in hub zone and who is not and keep all the records on that. So let's talk about sales and marketing. Um, rule number one, do not take the shotgun approach to marketing. Um, again, just like having a business plan, you need to have a marketing plan. And the first step in a marketing plan is to do your market research. And, you know, this tells you who's buying what you're selling, you know, who's your competition, you know, how much money was spent on, um, you know, whatever it is that, that you happen to sell. If you don't have enough staff to do market research, you can always hire a marketing intern from a local college. Um, I know in some areas of the state, uh, in any school of business, uh, that a lot of them require internships for their students. So that might be a good place to tap into. Um, marketing materials have to be customized for government agencies, and it's not one size fits all. So if you're looking to market to uh, the Port of Seattle, if you're looking to market to the city of Tacoma or Joint Base lewis McCord, or uh, the Naval Warfare Center out at Kitsap, they all have different requirements on what has to be on your marketing materials. So, you know, this may seem a little overwhelming, but, um, you know, PTACs are around to, to give you a hand on this aspect in particular. So just put a little star next to this and, and uh, check in with us and, and we'll get you started on that. Um, networking is the most important thing that, that you can do because the reality is it's all about who you know and it's a matter of you distributing your marketing materials in person or via social media. You know, back in the day where we used to have in-person conferences where you would go to trade shows and take your business cards and stuff, 
you know, it'll come back to that. But in the meantime, you have to kind of adjust to a brave new world for social media and develop your materials so that you can just distribute your information that way to them. And don't discount your professional associations, be it, um, you know, the Institute for Architects or Landscape Architects or CPAs or, or you know, any age, you know, professional association that you have, yeah, you know, because I'm sure that if you have a particular industry like engineering, that a lot of them are doing government at state, local, or federal levels, and uh, it'll be a, a good resource for you to have. And finally, on sales and marketing, um, just because you build it does not mean they will come. So you just have to, you know, keep, you know, sending out information and, and networking and participating in events as, as best you can. So when you're doing your marketing materials, here, you know, this is a list of, <clears throat> of things that, that are required to be on there. And I know that it, it looks like um, alphabet soup. And anytime you're talking about any government agencies, it's a matter of you know getting all these acronyms under your belt. Um, and we can help you know decipher all this for you. Um, at a federal level, you need a cage code and a DUNS number. At a state level, you need a UBI number. And all levels, you need NAICS codes and PSC and FSC codes. And then a list of all your certifications. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they want to know your past performance. Um, everything about you, your company background, your contact information, your capabilities of the firm and your key employees. And this is really important because maybe you have a brand new company. They still want to know that your key employee, you know, has been, you know, a master carpenter for 25 years or, you know, that you work for a really large company and you managed uh, huge projects for some of the big primes. Um, those all, you know, will look favorable to you. Um, and then finally, they want to know what makes you different from your competition. And, you know, and we can uh, sit down and work with you and, and kind of, you know, figure out, you know, what makes your little company so much better than all the others. Yeah. Okay. So I'm frozen. Okay, there it is. Okay, sorry about that. Um, let's talk about production and service. So if you are creating anything uh, to sell, the uh, American made is a federal priority. And if you are making things in America, where are you getting your materials? Are they also American or are they imported from another country? You know, are you building cars and, and you get your batteries from Canada and, you, and your, your tires from uh, Japan? Um, or are you bringing in parts from um, Iraq or Pakistan or Afghanistan, you know? So you have to know that um, material resources uh, could have some restrictions on them. But the really big thing on here is you are required to have a quality assurance manual. You know, they want to know everything about this widget that you're building and, you know, all the specs that you have on it, you know, dimensions and weight and, and you know, what the ingredients are in it, you know, if you're a pastry chef and it, anyway, they need everything in regards to the products that, that you um, put together 
in a quality assurance manual. But if you just do service like catering or accounting, um, they would like to see some of your certifications. You know, as an accountant, are you a CPA, a CMA, a CIA, a CFE? Um, you know, they want to see all the acronyms after your name. Engineering, are you a PE? And, you know, do you do lawn maintenance? Do you belong to the American Institute of Architects or the American Landscaping Association? Anyway, they want to see your professional certifications and affiliations. Okay, so let's do business with the state of Washington. So this page, I, I put on um, some real quick direct links for the Washington State Department of Enterprise Services, the Office of Minority and Women Business Enterprises, the Port of Seattle, and the Washington State Department of Veterans Affairs. So first one up is the Department of Enterprise Services. And on here, I have listed resources so that you can see the contracts that are existing. Um, there is a very simple registration process for the Department of Enterprise Services. And um, they, also, they, they call it the um, Washington Webs. So you see in the, in the URL there, it's fortress.wa.gov slash GA slash webs. And um, I'll have a few screenshots on this in a bit and kind of see how simple it is. Um, and they do not necessarily ask for NAICS codes, but they want to look, you know, they want to be able to look you up based on commodity codes. Like, you know, you do roofing or painting. Um, are you a consultant? Are you a teacher? You know, those are the key words that they're looking for. And then also they, um, they have an option for you to sign up for email alerts. So if they're looking for roofing companies, uh, you will receive an update from them on uh, new opportunities. So this past year on the Washington Electronic Business Solution, Washington Webs, I asked for an update on um, the status of their set-asides for small business. And historically, it goes back to 2003. And you know, I had information for 2003, 2014, 2020, and then 2021. And I just want you to, to see the growth overall for all active businesses. And then the very last column is a change from, 20, from 2020 to 2021. And you can see that some of these had growth and some of them kind of slipped back. But we all know that the reason that um, that there's any parentheses on this column is because of the impact that COVID had on small businesses and the shutdowns in all the small businesses. But if you are a um, minority business enterprise or woman business enterprise or a woman minority business enterprise, um, and you'll see that uh, there's actually been quite a, a bit of growth overall from 2003 to 2021 for all of those. And then the MBEs actually slipped over the last year, but um, hopefully it'll, it'll come back this next year. And then the, the last one on here is a veteran-owned small business or service disabled veteran on small business. In 2003, that was not even a thing. And so um, I don't know what year it actually started, but in 2014, they had 386 companies registered. And now in 2021, 
they have over 1700 companies registered, which is um, spectacular. Um, and, and then you also, as you're moving through anything that has to do with the state of Washington, you know, that there's three classifications, small business, mini business, and micro business. So you can be a small business if you have 50 or fewer employees or your annual gross revenue is less than $7 million for each of the past three consecutive years or it is certified by OMWBE. Um, you are a mini business if your annual gross revenue is between one and $3 million and a micro business if your annual gross revenue is under $1 million. So this is a screenshot that I told you about for Washington Webs. And this is basically it in a nutshell. They just want name, federal tax ID numbers, um, company name and revenue number, employees, UBI numbers, uh, percentage of ownership, you know, what kind of certifications or licenses you have, and then your corporate information. So what are the advantages and disadvantages of doing any government contracting? Well, using a scale of one to five, one being extremely small, two is small, three medium, four fairly large, and five extremely large, if you are bidding for local small towns, the bidding competition is probably going to be extremely small. The paperwork will never be extremely small, but it's not, you know, it, it's really diminished compared to all the other agencies. And then, you know, if there is even you know, any kind of government certification, um, you know, if, if you're doing something, you know, for the, the small town of uh, Monroe, Washington, you know, do they just want you to be certified as small business? You know, they're not going to make you go through a bunch of hoops necessarily at the state level or even at the federal level. So you need to kind of pay attention as to, um, you know, the uh, certification process. The biggest challenge will be finding the opportunities, but in a small town, it's probably all about who you know. So keep that in mind, you know, if you're in big cities or little cities, yeah, and then at the city level, county, you know, regional level, state, and then federal level, um, jumping up to the county level, um, you know, there's a fair amount of bidding competition, fair amount of paperwork, and then the certification. Um, some counties will require certification, but to be upfront with you about like Spokane County, they don't require anything. So you have to do your homework and see what your counties are requiring. Um, so again, finding the opportunities, you know, you have increased competition and additional paperwork. And then um, moving up to the federal government, bidding competition, yeah, this is going to be tough. You know, you're going to be competing with people across the nation and including uh, companies from out of the country. Um, the paperwork can be daunting, to say the least, and the certification process is not going to be easy. Um, and if you look right above there at the state level, uh, you know, the state certification is uh, not easy either, with one exception, and that's the veteran-owned small business. But at the federal level, you really have to have all your paperwork in line and, you know, work through the process. You know, particularly if you're looking for, like, hub zone certification or, you um, 
8A, which is uh, socially and, and economically disadvantaged small businesses uh, certification. And we can help, you know, walk you through, you know, these opportunities and, and see if any of those are a good fit for you. So if you get registered at the state level, the federal government does not recognize that certification and vice versa. So the veterans can be a certified veteran entity. And right now that's coming from the Veterans Administration, but that is being handed off to the Small Business Administration. And that is not the same as if you were certified at the state of Washington as a veteran owned business. Same thing with the minority owned federal 8A certification is not the same as the Washington state MBE. Woman owned, same thing. And hub zone, there is not anything currently similar in the state of Washington. Um, again, that is a um, uh, historically underutilized business zone, and but there's rumblings from Olympia on the integration of something similar um, coming down the road for the state of Washington. Now, uh, WashDOT, Washington State Department of Transportation, and USDOT have some similarities, and these are the only entities that talk to each other. And as we you know, go through these, you'll see that um, USDOT wants disadvantaged business enterprises. Uh, WashDOT wants disadvantaged business enterprises. And so it's like one-stop shopping at Washington State. You can get certified at both levels. <clears throat> Um, so let's talk about the Office of Minority and Women-Owned Business Enterprises. So again, a little more alphabet soup, and I gave you some links on here for the certification. And um, so one of the things, you know, we kind of talk about minority business enterprise, women, women minority, and the disadvantaged business enterprise. But number five on there is a small business enterprise. And yeah, that is um, uh, gender neutral and also uh, um, socially neutral. S you know, so you know, if you don't fit any of these other classifications, you know, perhaps you fit the small business enterprise one. So, and then the last thing on here is the hub zone, which may or may not show up in the list. We were still waiting. So the office of OMWBE is the only entity that charges you for the certification. And um, they have application fees based on your uh, company status and then also on the uh, federal certifications that you're doing. And these are not refundable. So let's move on to the Port of Seattle contacts. Um, I, I put up here right at the very top, the bid opportunities for doing business with the Port of Seattle. And uh, we've had uh, the Director of Diversity and Contracting, Mian Rice, uh, participate with us uh, for a, a number of, of our sessions this year. And um, he's very approachable. Lawrence Coleman is the Woman Minority Business Enterprise Manager. He did a session for us a week or two ago. Tina Boyd, a Woman Minority Business Enterprise and Disadvantaged Business Coordinator. So those three would be like a direct contact for you if you needed some assistance in um, working with the Port of Seattle as a uh, diverse company. And Michael Ro Roberson, um, I think Tina told us that 
recently that they're replacing that position. So stay tuned for more information on that. Uh, Port of Seattle, excuse me, has what's called Vendor Connect. And it has uh, where you can find the solicitations. And anyway, a lot of uh, good resources for you to kind of go in and peruse this and see what's available. And then, um, you know, decide to go or no go based on, on what you find. And then the contact on this is Tamara Hamill. And I put her email address on here for you. And um, so number four, the Department of Veterans Affairs. So to be eligible for certification, you can be um, active duty or reserve or National Guard service are all eligible to be registered. And your company to be the veteran status is um, you must control and own at least 51% of the business and must be legally operating in the state of Washington. Um, if the company is a 50-50 split, um, we have a contact number on here for you to talk to um, that office directly on the issues. So to become certified at the state level, you need your DD-214, you need your Washington State UBI number, you need NAICS codes, you need to tell them if you're service disabled veteran owned small business or veteran owned small business. And to be service disabled veteran owned small business, you need your letter of determination from the Veterans Administration as to your eligibility um, for disability. Um, and then once you get enrolled on there, it's easy. You know, you have a downloadable decal that you can put on your uh, marketing materials. So your point of contact is Jennifer Montgomery. And um, we have her email address and phone number, phone number here if you want to uh, visit with her a little bit. She's very approachable. Leslie, can I make one comment? This is Marnie. Hi, Marnie. Hi, I just wanted to clarify one thing for the veteran owned business for Washington State. Uh, I was just talking to, to somebody at the state yesterday about this and it you have to be incorporated within the state of Washington. So they do not recognize foreign companies um, for that certification. That's good to know because I, I know a lot of small businesses will be incorporated like in Delaware and that shows up as a foreign company in the state of Washington. So that, that's good to know. I'm, I'm glad you jumped in on that. Thanks, Marnie. Okay, so let's talk about contracting with the federal government. So the federal government buys virtually everything. And as of September, around the 1st of September, they had spent over $8 trillion for goods and services. Um, so who's the federal government up and down I-5? The US Navy. We have uh, NAVFAC Northwest. We have Naval Undersea Warfare Center Division in Keyport. Uh, we have NAVSUP, the Feet Logistics Center out of Puget Sound, Joint Base Lewis McCord, the Veterans Administration, you know, Forest Service, the Army Corps of Engineers. There are lots and lots of opportunities, and particularly the U.S. Department of Transportation, huge projects going on on the Olympic Peninsula and they are in desperate need of small businesses. So um, just a small list to, to get you started. So I pulled this data from usaspending.gov. And so where did all the money go in the fiscal year 2021? 
uh, Department of Health and Human Services, Department of the Treasury, Social Security Administration, and Department of Defense are the top four. But you know, if you are um, dealing with the Department of Transportation, yeah, you know, that's 118 billion dollars that they, they spent. Um, Department of Interior, 21, almost $22 billion. And that's your national parks. Uh, Department of Agriculture, you know, that's the US Forest Service. So you need to know what main agencies oversee other entities, and we can kind of um, get you um, educated on, on that. Um, so Washington State opportunities for primes and subs. So I put on here this real quick laundry list. If you're looking for public works, job order contracts through the state of Washington Department of Enterprise Services, Washington Webs, MRSC, and we're going to talk about that in a second. Um, USDOT, WashDOT, Federal Highway Administration, um, colleges and universities. Yeah, you know, the University of Washington, WSU, Central Washington, Eastern Washington University, Evergreen College. You know, all of these are state opportunities. Uh, Port of Seattle, you know, um, lots and lots of resources for you. Okay, let's talk about the Municipal Research and Services Center. Maybe you're not really into any of the really, really big projects. Maybe you have a small landscaping company and you're up there in uh, Snohomish County and you want to target school districts. This entity has what's called MRSC rosters and it has a publication of opportunities in all of these types of entities fire districts, water districts, library districts, sewer districts, uh, port districts. And you know, so if you want to start small, this might be a, a good resource for you to uh, start small. So what are the pitfalls and what kind of guidance do we have for you? And you know, there's not a lot of words on here, but there's um, a lot of content to each one of this. The pitfalls are if you don't have good organizational skills or there's a huge amount of paperwork or you want to bid on this, but it just came out today and today's Tuesday and they want it by Monday. Short turnaround times. Um, you know, assets. Do I have enough cash if I'm going to ramp up production to build 100,000 widgets when I usually only do 10,000 a month? You know, do I have the equipment to manufacture that much? Do I have the staff to run the equipment or to run the office and take care of the paperwork? And, you know, do I have the personnel, the project managers and the supervisors, you know, to take care of everything? So the answers come down to two words, responsiveness and responsibilities. Responsiveness means you can fill out the paperwork on time and sign everything that needs to be signed. You know, that means that you are responsive. You know, you saw the paperwork, you downloaded the full scope, you submitted a bid and everything was perfect. They said no more than five pages and you have five pages. You don't have five and a half pages, and but you have five pages to submit. Uh, the number one error that contracting officers found is the lack of signature on the bid. So that all funds, falls under responsiveness. 
Responsibilities takes care of the assets and personnel. That means that you have the capacity to perform the contract. So money, equipment, people, office personnel, you know, whatever the pitfalls are, contracting officers are gonna designate it one of two things, how responsive you are and how responsible you are. Okay, so here's your reality check. Government contracting takes a lot of dedication, commitment, precision, and organization. And once you get registered in the federal database, it's going to open up the floodgates for, you know, all the, you know, spam and scammers and, and fishers, you know, people trying to, you know, get your money, particularly for things that you can get for free. Like, you know, you want to be certified as a woman-owned small business. Well, yeah, they'll, they'll get you through the certification and they'll only charge you $5,000. Or you can go through PTAC and they can, you know, guide you through this whole process and it won't cost you a penny other than your time. The reality is any of these third parties that call you, you're gonna to have to supply all this information to them anyway. So you might as well just do one or two more steps and send it in yourself. Um, the third bullet's my favorite. If you do any government contracting, your accountant and your HR manager should probably get a raise because their work is going to triple. Um, you need to accept the fact that being a very, very small business where you're a one person band, um, it's nearly impossible to do government contracting without some help. And the first step to getting help is from PTAC. And so with that, I'll open this up for any questions. So, Andrew. Um, I hadn't raised my hand yet. Well, okay, it says Andrew raised hand, okay. Yes, <laughs> but I have three. Um, one's a comment. When it comes to the personnel involved in government contracting, you can expect at least one full-time employee position's worth of man hours to be dedicated to it. If you really want to sincerely go after these things, just compliance with the FARs and dealing with that, at least one FTE. So there, just want to throw that out. But my question is, a uh, previous speaker had mentioned that hiring laws in the state of Washington prohibit asking about felonies. And I'm wondering how you balance that with the federal government's reluctance to deal with felons without proper clearance? Well, it, it has to do with um, to be eligible to do the job, you know, if it's a roofer, you know, they have to have the physical capacity to get on the roof. And yes, you have to accommodate that, be it a man lift or a ladder or whatever. Um, but to get through the gate on a military installation, you know, if, if you are hired specifically to do a job at a JBLM or Fairchild Air Force Base or, you know, uh, Davis Motham or whatever, um, you're not going to get on the base, which means that you cannot perform the job. So, you know, that is one of the things that has to be asked. If it is specific, you know, and on the background check and, you know, giving second chances is a good thing, um, but we don't want anybody burned. We don't want the employee burned because they couldn't get on base and we don't want us burned because, you know, we can't complete the contract because we don't have the personnel. Okay, anything else? So if you need to reach out to Washington PTAC, I put the uh, URL up here at the top and we do 
you know, one-on-one -on -one counseling. We put on workshops. We have a bid match service um, that we offer for free for 30 days. And we do matchmaking. You know, we do events like this that we're doing with the Port of Seattle all year round. So if you need anything at all, Washington PTAC can uh, give you a hand and uh, connect you. <clears throat> Oh, and I see that Marnie has her hand raised. I just want to make a quick plug. Um, we currently at PTEC are partnering with OMWBE to offer one year free BidMet su subscription to state certified businesses. So if the business has an MBE, WBE, CBE, MWBE or SEDBE through OMWBE, um, you can go to our website, fill up a bid match form, and you can get bid match for one year for free. Okay. Thanks, Marty. <laughs> do, hello. One more question. Sorry, my internet cut out. Um, do veteran-owned businesses certification through Washington State require an article of incorporation um, for the state I, certified? Well, the, they require legal documents. You know, if you are... Um, a corporation, you know, articles of incorporation, uh, operating agreements, you know, if you're uh, limited liability, um, you know, there's other structures within that that they will request. And we can help, uh, uh, help you figure out what's needed on it. That's it for right now. We'll, we'll be ready in a couple minutes for our, our next session. So um, Lisa, if you're ready, um, go ahead. Good afternoon. My name is Lisa Fair and I am the Economic Development Small Business Manager within Sound Transit's Office of Civil Rights, Equity and Inclusion. Um, thank you for giving Sound Transit an opportunity to speak with you all today and it is a pleasure to be here. I wanna start out by sharing Sound Transit's recent achievement which I am very proud to announce that Sound Transit opened the Northgate Lake extension this past weekend and yesterday to our commuters, which allows reliable traffic-free trips of only 13 minutes between Northgate and downtown Seattle. The grand opening included stations at University District, Roosevelt and Northgate. With that being said, I wanna start talking about our program and just point out the fact that Sound Transit is an equal employment, equal opportunity employer. And we encourage small minority women and disadvantaged business enterprises to participate in the competitive procurement process. As a recipient of federal transit administration funds, we are required to have a disadvantaged business enterprise program. And currently this year have an overall goal of 16.39% that we're tracking attainment on. Our projects have approximately $54 billion in work over the next 20 plus years, which spans across three counties. So that means there's still a lot of work ahead and opportunity ahead. I would like to make sure that if you are interested in doing work with us at Sound Transit, you know how to access the information about upcoming opportunities. And Sound Transit has partnered with Bedingo to provide information regarding contracted, contracting opportunities at Sound Transit. All guests to our Bedingo site can view solicitations, bid results, and award information. If you are interested in working with us, you can register to receive email notifications about upcoming opportunities. In addition to advertising contracting opportunities on Bedingo, it is also Sound Transit's policy to advertise solicitations greater than $250,000 in the Daily Journal of Commerce. I want to just say again, thank you for allowing us to be here today, and I commend all of you for your investment you have made in your business by attending this technical assistance educational opportunity, and wish you all the best and much success. And I am going to turn this over to Mrs. Lily Keefe now, who I work with in our economic development department. 
Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. And just, just a little correction. Lisa Fair is a small business manager for economic development, civil rights, uh, Office of Civil Rights, Equity and Inclusion. So thank you so much, Lisa. I'm just gonna start the presentation. It's gonna be you know, very short and sweet. I really just wanna get connected with the people. You know, I used to work for Northwest SBTRC, so my heart is always connected, connected to Leslie and all the folks. So yeah, I'm gonna start my presentation. So I'm gonna share the screen. A little bit, you know, rusty with uh, <laughs> with sharing the screen. Okay, let me do this. Okay, let's just start. I think um, slideshow from the beginning. So um, this is our Economic Development Office of Civil Rights, Equity and Inclusion. Just uh, here we are, I just wanna talk about our Office of Civil Rights, Equity and Inclusion. We have four roles, you know, economic development, inclusive culture, compliance and monitoring, equity and social responsibility. So basically with the vision, we support this work. You know, we wanna make sure that employees, passenger, the community, small business community are feel welcome and connected with us. You know, they, they could reach out to us and have the fair access for opportunity program and services that's including contracts. And the mission of our department is to advance civil rights, equity and inclusion, of course, for the employee passengers and the community, including small business community. So we have two numeric goals in our uh, federally funded project. So Sound Transit received a recipient of the federal um, funds, you know, federal transit um, administration. So we have a DBE goals and we are required to implement the, um, the DBE goals through the US Office of um, Minority and Woman Business Enterprise, OMWBE. And as you know, you're probably going to learn more about the certification. So DB is for profit, um, small business that at least 51% owned by individuals who are socially and economically disadvantaged. And Sound Transit also have a small business goals. Business must meet the SBA size standard and be below $26.29 million in gross receipts over the last five years. And um, we recognize actually SCS. Um, certification for small business and also SBE certification with OMWBE. So we recommend firms who are not certified yet to start looking at all this certification. It's a great marketing, you know, for especially it's going to fit to our goals. And a little bit about the disadvantaged business um, enterprise program. As you know that we are the recipient of FTA funding. So of course we have to implement the DBE program. And the objective is to create level playing of uh, uh, level, level playing field so DBE could compete fairly, make sure there's no discrimination, remove barriers, regulatory monitoring, compliance, and also to promote all types of DBEs. And um, again, since I said that we are the FTA um, funding recipients, our contracts must meet the requirements, which is, you know, with FDA funded projects, we perform uh, DBE commercially useful functions, CUF reviews on the project. So if you are a DBE firm, or if you're not yet a DBE, and then you bid on a sound transit project, you know, as a DBE, and you work on a DBE project uh, in a FDA funded projects, you must perform commercially useful function or CUF. What it means, you have to show that you perform the work, you are the owner, you have the control of your management of the work. So we will implement CUF in every life cycle of the project from the beginning, in the middle and at the end. And since you work for um, sound transit projects, you are required to report your monthly payment. You know, I, I guess, you know, when you work with the private industry, you don't have to report, you know, you receive payment, move on. So if you work with our FDA funded projects, you are required to do that. And if you become a prime for our um, projects, you 
as soon as you receive the money, you must implement five day prompt payment requirement. So Lisa mentioned earlier about our, our overall DBE goal, uh, federal fiscal year 2018 to 2020. Our agency goal um, set 16.1% and we achieved that goal. The attainment is 19 for 19.29%. Uh, and um, this goal for this year is 16.39% for the contracts. Um, 9.39% is race, gender, conscience means, and 7% is race, gender, neutral means. So race, gender, conscious means, so anything, any program that built on the DBE, so if you're DBE and we set the goal for that DBE, so that it means like the race, gender, conscious. For the race neutral, so even though, you know, federally funded projects, we have the DBE goal, we also have the SBE goal. And the DBE is kind of like a subset of the SBE goal. Um, Leveling the playing field, you know, we mentioned earlier that, you know, one of the DBE objective is leveling the playing field. And this is, this is one of the example, this, this training, you know, is I always like have a, like a, I always encourage my clients to just go to the training, even though you know what you're doing. This is the forum when you learn about, you know, how you build your capacity. So Sound Transit um, partnering to provide additional technical assistance. We partner with Aisha Group, you know, USDOT, SBTRC. And we also partner with Minority Business Development Agency with the city of Tacoma. And one of the program that right now we are still um, open uh, enrollment is capacity building mentorship program. And I know it's tough right now with COVID. And I always recommend people try to look around, you know, like try to join as much as networking as possible. and you know, with capacity building mentoring program, if you are um, eligible for it, the program is free, you will be paired with the mentors who are the prime contractors currently working on a sound transit projects. That's how you get connected. And um, the example of sound transit, small capital projects, you know, we have the threshold that you could see under $50,000, $50,000, $350,000. I mean, you could see all this threshold and then um, my note is always for small business, always focusing, if you're just starting out, go with the small one, go with the under $50,000, do the work. You know, Leslie mentioned earlier in the presentation, do you have the resource to take on like $500,000 project? Do you have the administrator? Do you have the um, a, a one person who could deal with the invoicing and stuff like that? Um, I mean, it's just a tough work, you know, a lot of like firms talk about, I want to be part of JCCM or design build. It is a very complex projects. And I always, you know, I'm sorry to say like a, a Debbie Downer to the people like, don't go after that projects, go with the smaller one, you know, start seeing it, feeling it, you know, be successful in it. And then, and then you, you know, baby steps. So um, this is just kind of like the overall, you know, uh, threshold of our contracts. And this is the snapshot of our uh, upcoming project. This is not the most updated. I just want to show it to you guys so you know, like, if you go to Sound Transit website, the external page, and you see all this biweekly procurement snapshot where you could see design and construction. It's kind of like the, um, the bid system that um, Marnie was talking about, you know, but I think PTAC have more comprehensive bidding system like a uh, um, uh, so you could you know identify opportunities this one is solely just sound transit so um if you take a look at this you know snapshot and say hey i think i could do the you know the any work then register with our bidingo you know i'm gonna go with the bidingo system you know i'm just gonna share with you guys a little bit about bidingo so it'll be easy for you guys to see and feel what is Bedingo. So um, let me share it again. Uh, can you see my screen? I think the Bedingo. Leslie, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Yeah. So yeah, this is, this is the Bedingo system. You know, you 
you just register and put your information. And once you register, you get all this information. I mean, now, you know, let's talk about any, you know, opportunities. You could see here, there's citizen oversight panel administrator, right? That's part of the a &E, you know, like non-construction. Or let's talk about cost estimate, cost saving assessment work. So in order for you to be able to access this information or to be able to see the past projects that you probably is a good fit for your project, uh, for your business, and you want to see like, hey, that project is on call work and it's going to be like, you know, expired next month. I better, you know, sign up with Bedingo and learn more on how to, you know, maneuver with some transit procurement. Let me just go back again to my PowerPoint. So, so yeah, we have Bedingo, we have small work roster, and we have soundtransit.org doing business with us. I'll just share with you as well this um, doing business with Sound Transit. We have everything in this page. You know, you could see um, we have upcoming project. This is my department with the CRE Economic Development, and you could see. Um, all the good stuff here. So um, feel free if you have any, um, you know, problems doing, uh, you know, uh, registering. Do you have any questions? I heard somebody talking. Okay. So um, so here's the team. Lisa Fair is my uh, manager, and I have teammates. You know, subject matter expert and um, Jackie Doty. Mick Robertson, Robertson, Tanya Moda, email us, call us if you have any questions. And, um, and then here's some more resource links that I want to share with you guys, you know, King County, SCS, certification, OMWBE, um, you know, small business resource guide. Um, and yeah, that concludes my presentation and I'll be happy to answer any questions well th thanks lily and uh thank you to lisa for um doing the introduction and uh my my apologies for getting her title uh, a little oh, off no worries. but um in our chat andrew has actually posted a bunch of the links so that oh. uh, our participants can click right through this but all you know, your presentation will be available to um, everybody. We, you know, we share that with the participants. So um, actually, could you tell us a little bit more about the uh, Bedingo? Um, how long have you guys had had that? And, and uh, is I that think, I think uh, some trends it started with the EBIT. And then, you know, and then now with Bedingo, it's kind of like transitioning to, uh, you know, Bedingo, right? So basically with Bedingo, once you sign up, then you will be able to get the alert. You know, you put your next codes, right? It's kind of like work like your bidding, um, uh, uh, yeah, bid match. Yeah. So, but it's only for sound transit. And the coolest part, sometimes this is the thing that I would like to share with people, like, you know, some of the a &E on call work, for instance, right? They, they award it for like three to five years, right, to the firm. And maybe they expire. This is a good opportunity for you to really do your marketing. You go there and you take a look at it. Let's say I'll see George Frost earlier, you know. So let's say doing community engagement work. And then you see the community engagement work maybe awarded to a company and then it's going to be expired or be done this month. Get ready, you know, get connected with us. And some of the event that is really good opportunity to get connected with the procurement, because I'm not a procurement, but I'm a small business and a DBE expert. So if you need anything, we are the catalyst that bridge, you know, the relationship between the procurement people because, you know, they're busy, right, with COVID. They're, you know, processing all the procurement stuff. You know, we have $52 billion to spend in the next 25 years, you know, with the light rail projects. So feel free to reach out to me and I'll be happy. I actually, I would like to create some sort of like a lunch learn, you know, teaming up with Aisha or Marnie to just to have an open hours where people could talk and like, hey, you know, I, I'm a and &E. 
I can't even, you know, I can't bid on a sound transit project. I don't know how to start. Or maybe you're frustrated because for years you've been trying and it didn't work out. I think some things that need to learn with the A&E firms, you need to learn about direct indirect cost rates. That's really important. That's the key on how you really want to be successful. I mean, in the private world, it's easy to bid stuff, right? I mean, you just come up with like, you know, <laughs> rates that, you know, yeah, 500 bucks. Not in the federally funded projects, you know, there are rules. And then you need to understand in that, within that overhead, you know, cost, you need to understand what is like, you know, in compliance with the regulation. That's why it's really, really important for people to really go and then, you know, do the training. You know, I, I heard a lot of small businesses like, I don't need training. I need contracts. And you have problems with <laughs> doing your contracts because you don't need a training, you know, capacity building technical assistance you need that in a life cycle it's almost like you know it's like reading regulation right you know you read regulation two years ago and then you know right now it's completely different you have the different perspective mindset oh now i understand what it means with this you know overhead you know or stuff all the jargon that you probably didn't even have any clue when you're reading it two years ago now you're doing it you make mistakes you go back to regulation I'm good now, right? That's the key. And then I, and I really, you know, I'm so fortunate to have partners like PTAC and, you know, SVTRC. And then now we have this capacity mentorship building program. Go and check it out. And, and if you like, hey, Lily, do you know any, um, any, you know, prime consultant that we could talk to? I'll be happy to reach out. But again, before you talk to them, right? I mean, just put yourself in that position. Get yourself ready, you know, you understand the indirect, direct costs, have your marketing tool, get certified. Don't get certified after you have a meeting with the prime contractors. I mean, I have a client that's just come to me like, yeah, I just have a meeting with the prime contractor. They asked me about my certification and I said, well, I'm self-certified. Well, with Sound Transit, we don't recognize self-certified as SBA. We recognize SES, OMWB with SBE or DBE. So it's really important. And then once you get that certification, that's your marketing. Doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna get the contracts. It comes down to your quality of your work, your pricing. I mean, that's just, you know, my two cents because, you know, we work together as a technical assistance. Now I'm on the other side as the agency. Now I could see more, you know, like why it's really important for technical assistance, for capacity building for the firms, you know, this is all, Mitigating the risk. When you do the work and you fail, we don't want you to fail. We will help you. But, you know, you don't want to be failed. Just be prepared not to be failed. <laughs> That's all. So, so um, Lily, I see we have a hand up. Um, okay. Marnie, do, do you have a question? Yeah, I do. Hi, Lily. It's Marnie. Um, Hi. <laughs> I was wondering... Um, I really am glad to hear that you guys recognize SCS. So, so few agencies recognize each other's um, certifications. So I'm glad yeah. to hear that. Can you speak to the difference between prime and sub? So the Sound Transit primarily utilize DBEs, SBEs, and SCS through subcontracts, or are there prime contracts that are available to these minority? Well, it depends, right? You know, like, you know, for the complex project like JC, JC, GCCM or um, uh, uh, design build, of course, you know, it's a big giant, you know, the Skanska world or, you know, so that's like, you know, so for the DBE and uh, SBE, there are some contracts that, you know, goes under the, the uh, design build project that probably required subcontracting opportunities. That's when the SCS and the DBE play a key role. So, you know, when, when let's say, you know, we have earlier, I just show you, um, there is these um, Mercer Islands rebid for the roundabout, right? So um, it, it's only $7 million. So if you're just a small SBE, you want to bid on it, go ahead. And then we do have that goal, a small business goal for that. And so it depends, Marnie. So like some of the procurement, they, you know, majority of the mega projects, it's for the subcontracting opportunities, but for like uh, 
smaller procurements, you know, small roster, like a, a less than five hundred thousand dollars. That's when the SBE and DBE could act like a prime contractors. So, um, and again, like you know, in the bid process with Sound Transit, when you submit your bid, you include Form Three. We call it for, from Form Three, where you laid it out, like you know, like. The way it works, we have the project, right? We did a market research based on the size and based on the, the scope that is similar. We set the goals for SBE or the DBE goals. If you have a federal, uh, if you have a federally uh, funded projects, you have to set the DBE goals. But if you don't have it, then you just set the SBE, right? Because on transit have some projects that, that are not federally funded projects. So that's when the SCS is recognized. And then when you submit your bid, you put that form three, you know, and then you, you list your DBE or SBE in that list. And that's when you know, we check if it's like legit with OMWBE or with SCS. Because we, we actually countered, uh, encountered the problem with a firm that say, hey, we're self-certify. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, you could self-certify but still, we don't recognize self-certify as SBA. You know what I mean? Because it's just very vague, you know? So we use SCS and we use SBE with OMWBE to determine whether you're SBE and D or, you know, and with DBE. And another thing with DBE, we have a lot of DBE from out of state, you know, like uh, Oregon, you know, state or, you know, Idaho. They're like, hey, we're DBE. No, you have to <laughs> you're certified that, you know, OMWBE. So we're focusing on the OMWBE and SCS for the um, DBE and also for the SBE certifications. Did, did I answer your questions? Yeah, I have another one though. Um, if yeah. DBE Prime um, <laughs> wins the award, do they also have yeah. to fill out? They have to, so they have to accommodate all of the subcontracting plan for any work. So is it based off their commercially useful function? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, if you're the prime, the DBE, right? So that's, that's why I was talking about the contract goal set. So when we set the goal, like a baseline, right? So let's say 10% for DBE. And then you become a prime, let's say with that project earlier. And your DBE, you're counting 100%. <laughs> you already satisfy that. But if you want to hire a subcontractors under you, that's what we call the uh, race neutral come into play. Because we don't set that goal, but it's a commitment from the prime. But we will hold that commitment accountable because you declare that in a subcontracting form. Hey, I'm going to hire three or four DBEs. And, you know, so it's just kind of like more like an extra point. So um, it's not like, you know, in the evaluation, we look at the DBE because, you know, if you're DBE, and that's 100 percent. Automatically, you're going to fulfill that goal. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thanks, Lily. Thanks, uh, Marnie, for the questions. Um, do we have any other questions right now? Well, if we have no more further questions, um, again, I, I'd really like to, to thank Lisa Fair and Lily Keith from Sound Transit for being here um, this afternoon and, and uh, giving us all the highlights of uh, what's going on with DBE and, and Sound Transit. So again, thank you, Lily and, and Lisa. And we're going to take a short break. Thank you for the opportunity. And and, 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 and Leslie, I'm going to stay for another hour. So just in case somebody wants to talk, you know, in the chat. So feel free, you know, like I said, my passion is always about technical assistance. And, you know, so I'm just stick around and then, um, yeah, I'm, I'm here. I'm doing my work and then be here for you guys. Okay. Okay. So we'll, we'll take a, about a five minute break and we'll be ready for the next presentation at 2.35. That will be Understanding Design Built Pro Procurement Process by Danica um, Mason. So um, go out and stretch your legs. We'll be right back. Thank you. Uh, Danica Mason. And Danica is the principal for uh, Red Team Go. 
and uh, I know that um, she had put together a, a slideshow, and but because we have a really small, intimate group today, she wants to kind of mix it up a little bit. So with that, I'm just going to hand it over to Danica, and we'll let you run the show until you're done. Sounds good. Thank you. Uh, so with our smaller group, I do want to ask, you know, what are the things that you, do you know what design build is? Do you know how to get involved in design build? What do you want to know? Because I do have a presentation, but since we do have a very small group, I'm happy just to talk through what design build is and how to get involved and, you know, what it is that you guys want. If it's something that you already know what it is, then we don't need to go through that. <laughs> if you don't know what it is, we'll go through that. So, but I would like to hear from all of you where your thoughts are with this design build presentation as well. Well, Danica, I, I mean, I'm gonna... I have no idea. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I was going to say that. Let's do it from the beginning. <laughs> okay. And I'm totally fine to do that. I just wanted to make sure that I'm not going through something that none of you want to hear because you've been through it. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Let me figure out how to do this really quickly. Maybe. Okay. Perfect. All right. Design build, everyone's favorite. So I do want you to ask questions um, as I'm talking. You can use the chat function, you can interrupt me, but you know, don't wait and think that I want to talk for an hour because I really don't. <laughs> okay, so typical projects are done in what is considered design bid build or in the A&E world, you see work through the PS&E stage. That's our traditional project delivery. It's what almost every company focuses on. It's what a lot of owners do. The design's complete prior to advertising. We typically then see everything awarded to the lowest responsible bidder. So that's what we're mostly familiar with if we haven't done any sort of alternative delivery before. <clears throat> Let's see, maybe. So then design build is a delivery method where design and construction go to a single entity, generally led by a contractor. We very rarely see joint ventures with a contractor and a designer. And even more rare is it to see a designer lead a design build project. So from an A&E standpoint, really in order to get involved, you're looking to be either the lead designer or a sub consultant to the lead designer. And similar to how a lot of your typical A&E projects are re um, awarded, it is generally best value. Washington state is absolutely best value. There are other states that it's actually lowest responsible proposer versus a best value. Um, the biggest difference in bid build and design build is actually how the process works. So you can see bid build is very methodical. We go through you know, conceptual, preliminary, final. You do your engineer's estimates. The bids come in, RFIs are answered, final cost is determined, permits are issued, and they can be issued you know, either before the bid or right after. Contractor selected, goes into construction. In design build, you can see that the design, estimate and bid, final design, permits, construction, they all overlap. It kind of gets a little um, crazy at times if you look at it this way. So instead of doing a very lineal approach to design and construction, we end up doing a lot of overlapping in design build. So the reasons that we use design build or the owners typically use design build, it's faster, it provides cost certainty. 
So in a traditional design build project, it is a lump sum cost. There's also just recently in Washington state, we're starting to use progressive design build where it's not a lump sum cost at the time of a bid. It actually is advanced during the pre-construction or design phase and then an agreed to price or guaranteed maximum price is determined between the owner and the contractor. So once the design has been further advanced. Uh, design build offers benefits and constructability. So, you know, by engaging a design and construction team early in the process, you as the designer get more of that constructability review from people who are actually in the field versus having to change the plans after the job's been awarded. You get better partnering between all parties. And then, you know, the risk management is a lot better and there's opportunities for innovation. Um, and yes, Leslie, you asked if this model of design build applies to commercial, residential, and government. This is typically a government-based um, type of design build. Residential, I don't think I've ever actually seen design build done. Commercial design build tends to be more of a progressive design build or a CMGC type of situation. So in commercial, what will happen is we typically see the design builders selected and the there may be a price associated with that, but not necessarily the lump sum full bid price. They go through design, they're compensated for design and a price is negotiated somewhere between 60 and 95% of the design. So we see a lot of that happen in the water wastewater side. When does the um, um, consultants, apart from um, the designers and the contractors get involved um, early enough with um, design build, at what point can they come in? At what point do subconsultants come in? Subcontractors that, that, that are not in design field. Okay, yeah. That cost, yeah. So um, the subcontractors, it really depends on what you do. So, and I'll get into my next slide, I'll show you. So design build delivery generally kind of goes along these road, this road. So you go into an RFQ, which um, is quals based selection somewhere between three and five design build teams are shortlisted to an RFP. They provide a proposal. It is awarded, the design starts, and then typically you see phased release for construction packages. If you're a subcontractor, you can get involved anywhere from the very beginning of the entire process, so during the RFQ phase, through the buyout of the job. So once they're already under a contract, these release for construction packages are coming out, you'll often see that the primes and larger subcontractors put out additional opportunities to engage more of the subcontractor community. So it might be that um, the, for example, the earthwork package has already been awarded to someone, however, there's an opportunity within that earthwork package for the underground utilities. And that will go out on the street to get bids for that work. Does that help answer your question? Yeah, a little bit, but how does the construction management, and at what point do they come in from construction management and project management comes in? Okay, so the CMPM, um, it depends on the agency. With WashDOT, that tends to be awarded under the general engineering contract. So it's the GEC, which is per region or per program. So the 405 program, the 520 program, for example, those have their own separate GECs, but then Olympic region has a GEC that is for the entire region. Uh, those GECs are generally seven, several years of contract and they can 
be awarded well before any design build is ever out on the street. So a big thing to watch if you are on the CMPM side is know when the GECs are up for renewal and who's going after them so that you can team with those primes. So. Uh, are, they, are they involved at the constructability um, stage? Yeah, so the GEC or the PMCM will be involved, depending on the owner, in the constructability portion of the job. So as the design is developed, there are formal reviews, typically at 30, 60, 90 percent. And that is usually done by a combination of the owner, the PMCM, and any other stakeholders that need to review portions of the design. So it could be that there's a city street that's affected. So the city will review a portion of the design or, um, you know, if you've got something that has a building or a transit station, it may go to the state architect's office for a review. But the PMCM is generally involved in those formal milestone reviews. Thank you. Absolutely. Danica, I, would, I just want to have a question. So let's say, um, mm -hmm. you know, small business A&E, you know, construction management, they, they're interested in that portion. Like, is there any like potential like um, joint venture? Just because, you know, maybe we're too small. I mean, if we're new, like, you know, I mean, is there any like, well, maybe share some tips, like how this small <laughs> mom and pop A&E could survive. At least. I mean, I said that yeah. it's kind of contradict what I said earlier because I very discourage people. If you don't understand design build, do not bid on it. <laughs> but the point is like, at least we want to learn, right? Like, you know, strategizing mm -hmm. ourselves. I think that's the hardest part because I heard a lot of like any firms like, uh, uh, how? I mean, you know, <laughs> yeah. just like a chicken egg questions. Like, how am I going to, you know, maybe you could yeah. share some tips. Nope. And I have actually a whole piece on that. Okay, <laughs> if you've never been involved in design build. So the biggest things that you have to do is you have to recognize that it's a relationship-based industry. I and mean, we all know this from our years of experience in doing this. We see it in you know, calls-based selection. We know that we get those phone calls from the people that know that our companies can deliver. And so, you know, if you want to get involved in the PMCM side, yes, there is an opportunity for doing a joint venture. There's also an opportunity to be a sub to the primes that are doing the PMCM work. And, you know, sometimes it's project-based, sometimes it's program-based. Like I said, we, for example, I happen to know there's a large PMCM contract that just got submitted in a different state and it's for a single $900 million job. Each of the PMCM teams had a goal of, I think it was 30% small business, local small business, disabled veteran. Um, and it was all had to be certified through a certain agency because of where this project was. So there was a large percentage all of the teams that I talked to on this, they were all looking at having somewhere between 20 and 30 sub consultants on their PMCM team. So there's a lot of opportunity, but it really takes that time to go talk to the primes, know what jobs are coming out. Um, you know, the biggest thing that really can harm you in trying to get on these teams is to call up a prime and say, hey, I want to work with you. What do you have coming up? It needs to be that you've done your homework. You know what projects are coming, not the ones already on the street, but the ones that are coming up. And even if they've already teamed fully for that job and put their team together to go after it, it opens the door for you to be able to talk to them about the future pursuits that are coming out. So that's one of the biggest things that you can really do is be doing your homework, be doing your business development homework, know specifics, 
don't walk in and talk to a prime about a transit based um, set of calls when it's a highway job, for example. It just won't work. <laughs> they want you to, and you have to tailor your marketing materials to what the project is that you're looking at. You really need to be following the advanced schedules that come out from the various owners because they're often published somewhere between 12 and 36 months in advance of projects. Look at the CIPs, look at the TIPs. It's all public information. So if you want to be involved, you have to do homework. It doesn't just fall in your lap. Does that help, Lily? <laughs> oh, yeah, this is great. I mean, I really, this is, I really appreciate this. I mean, this is yeah. the thing that, you know, I really encourage, especially a &E firms. That's why it's really important, you know, meeting with Danica here. I mean, you're part of the, the group, you know, and then you could educate, you know, all these folks. And then I think a lot of A&E firms sometimes miss out the opportunity because especially with virtual, you can't meet people nowadays, <laughs> you know, so this is the forum is great, you know, and then you yep. guys going to have that outreach meeting and I'm hoping, you know, every A&E firms here going to join, you know, that outreach. Is that November 10? You guys said that? Yeah. Yeah. November 10. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. And, and the other thing is, there are generally specific procurement and inclusion managers for the primes. Whether that happens to be an A&E firm, whether it happens to be a contractor. So if the more you get to know them and talk to them and maintain contact, the greater your chances are of getting onto these teams. You know, and a big piece of it in order to get onto these teams is don't start with design build. Start with the traditional ps &E jobs. Know that you need to show them that you can deliver. And the biggest reason that I say start with the traditional jobs is because a typical PAED to ps and &E project takes anywhere from about 24 months to 60 months so two to five years to go from conceptual to full ps &E, ready for bid in design build we typically are going to tell you that you're going to go from 30 percent design to release for construction in somewhere between four and 12 months it's fast and so the primes that you're working with also need to have that confidence that you can deliver, you have the personnel to deliver, you haven't picked up more than you can on the project and won't be able to get it done in the timeline that's required. You're thorough, so there's not going to be, you know, if you're an engineering firm, you're not putting your plans back with tons of comments. You should know what the specs are, you should be able to meet the specs, it should reduce the number of comments that come back from the owner. Um, and then budget, you have to be able to maintain your budgets. So, you know, really proving yourself to the primes that you want to work with on bid build jobs is one of the biggest ways to get the work on the design builds because it is extremely different, you know, and I help contractors put teams together. I've rejected design managers on 800, 900 million dollar jobs because they've never done design build. They only can show me PAED, ps &E work. It's so very different that you have to be able to really get into how do you prove that you can do the work. So... What other questions are there? <laughs> so can you share with me the pitfall of the failures for small businesses, particularly a &E that you probably experienced, you know, lesson learned, right? Something that you want to just kind of like share with us. Hey, listen, don't do this. You know, sometimes we don't learn that design build failure from the textbooks, you know, yeah. <laughs> we learn that from doing it. So, 
Yeah. So the biggest things that we see as pitfalls, number one is not delivering. If you can't deliver, it's not going to reflect well on you. So you really have to know the scope that you take on on a design build is something that you can deliver on. The other things that we see that create challenges are in having your insurance. So typically on these design builds, the insurance requirements are pretty hefty, but those can always be negotiated. It really, you have to talk to the primes though and talk to your upper tiers. Um, the other big thing that I see is not putting enough resources on these jobs. So, you know, knowing that you're going to have to staff it correctly. Pre-COVID, we would see co-location as a requirement, meaning that the entire design team, the entire construction team, the owner, the owner's rep, the PMCM, whatever you want to call it, all sitting in one building. And working together and doing over the shoulder reviews and having those day to day conversations. We're not seeing that as much right now, but that's not an excuse not to communicate, not to partner, not to deliver your work. It's a lot easier to let things slide right now because of the way that COVID has affected everyone and we've moved to this virtual world where you can work on three things at once. However, you really need to be able to focus on these design build jobs. So if you're going to take one on and even a chunk of one, you have to bring the focus into it and really deliver. You know, my worst nightmare in working on these design builds is when I'm told, hey, our design is now delayed by a year and a half and our permits are going to expire. That is one of the worst things that can happen to a lot of contractors. You know, especially when you're talking about projects that have, for example, a fish window. If the permit expires, it's a really big deal. So those are kind of the biggest things that we see from our side and companies getting involved in design build that just, you're not ready if you aren't delivering. And also, Danica, I just want to ask you a question because, you know, since now is COVID, right? I've seen a lot of this more like a job seeker, um, you know, world, right? A lot of like, you know, employers is finding, you know, challenges to hire people. So the point is, if you're small, any firms working on a design build, right? You have a team mm -hmm. in the beginning. Let's say you have two staff, right? And what happened if the staff or if there's like a, like promotion or like, you know, the, 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 the rate change, you know, the staff, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> maybe after a year, they said, hey, I want to be a director. So the, the rate change, I mean, is that something that, and especially now, because like it's so competitive for, you know, for employers to recruit like the best qualified, you know, individual. And they just mm -hmm. go, I'm, well, I'm not, I don't want to do $40 an hour. I want to do $65 an hour. I mean, do you see any problems with that? Because I'm seeing a lot of problem with the, a &E firms with the staffing mm -hmm. because then you submitted your price, right? Your bid, you right. know, like your rates of your employees. And then now your employees are like, we, we want more. I mean, is there something that you always recommend? I, mean, I guess this is just more technical. Like, you know, like, is yeah. there something that you have to put contingency, like some kind of like uh, negotiating, like, um, like, I mean, like rates, you know, for our employees, just in case give that little buffer cushion for that. Yeah, so one of the things that we do see quite a bit um, in the a &E world is that rather than putting specific names down, we'll put classifications of employees and give a rate that has a range to it, right? So for example, you know, an engineer one could have a rate of, you know, fully burdened 50 to $75 to give you that wiggle room, right? And then you could have your senior engineer has their fully burden rate is somewhere between 120 and 180. So that you have that buffer rather than being stuck on, well, I put one name, this is all I get, this is how it's going to work. And I don't know how common it is to 
stick to that single name in Washington. But I know, you know, for example, we work a lot with Caltrans. And if you put a name down, that's who you get. You don't get to assign anyone else to the job. (laughs) If you put a classification down, we can pick and choose who we're assigning to the job. And, you know, and knowing what your overhead rate is. And if you don't have an audited overhead rate, that you have a safe harbor rate and that you're willing to negotiate what that percentage of uh, profit is, because that makes a difference as well. So those are some of the things that we really do see. That's awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So Danica, can you address uh, what has been happening over this past year in regards to um, bidding and shortage of materials and supplies? Yeah. And and the repercussions of that, but also the workarounds for for that? Yeah, so part of what we're seeing is certainly an increase in costs, whether it's professional services or materials. That is affecting things. On a design build, though, you're in a lump sum situation. So generally, that's one where if you are a lower tier sub and you're being impacted by it, you, number one, you have to go talk to the prime. But once you've given that bid, just like on any other bid build job, there's not usually a contingency for increases like that. Um, But that's where your partnering and your communication really comes in. If it's really affecting you negatively, you may be able to work something out with the prime. But knowing that, for example, you're, the owner isn't going to pay for an escalation in material cost. You know, we generally don't see that. When, you know, we had the gas prices that rose overnight, essentially, and rose so high, owners weren't paying for that. <laughs> that was something that contractors just had to cover. Um, and it hurts on the profit side, but hopefully you're making enough profit that you still are making some profit is the idea behind that. What we are seeing as a repercussion is that new bids are coming in higher. So engineers estimates are extremely off right now. I've seen bids coming in anywhere from 40 to 60% higher than the engineer's estimates, which is just absolutely crazy as far as some of us are concerned. (laughs) Um, And so it's really, until things balance out, that's how we're going to be. You know, unfortunately, when it comes to hard bid work, the engineer's estimates sometimes are three or four years old before the job gets released. And owners don't always go through and update what that engineer's estimate is before they put it out to bid. And so, Owners are having to accept higher bids right now. And that's just what's happening. We're expecting to see that come down here probably in the next six to eight months and for things to start settling out. But, you know, from the A&E side, it's knowing what the current prices are when you're putting together the engineer's estimates. It's knowing what the historical curves have looked like. It's knowing what the projections look like in order to help the owners understand what the um, repercussions of all of this have been. You know, and then there's of course the staffing issue where we're all struggling to find staff. Every single one of us is struggling to find staff. Um, And it's across the country. It's not just in Washington. You know, I talk to my colleagues all over and everyone's struggling to hire because people are leaving and taking higher rates of pay because small businesses don't generally get to pay as much as the large businesses. And so, you know, one of the things that we've done is, for example, we are a small business um, and we've just had to up what we pay. It's the price of doing business right now. So, and I've been using a recruiter to hire new people and had to accept the fact that I'm going to hire outside of Washington because I can't find people in Washington state. So there's ways to work around it. Um, You know, and we are starting to see that there's 
a change, for example, in the safe harbor rates. Caltrans just adopted a one point or 120 percent instead of 110 percent. That just went into effect within the last three weeks. So we're starting to see owners updating their safe harbor rates because of all of this as well. So that's actually nice. Do you think we are going to adopt the same way too here? I mean, that's another problem with my our clients. 110. I mean, that's it's <laughs> killing it. You know, I mean, <laughs> I've seen somebody in the any work, you know, 250, and I'm like, whoa. So I mean. Yeah. I mean, is, is that something that we could adopt to, you know, Caltrans is implementing it, you know? I mean, so. it absolutely could happen. It just okay. is going to depend on how everything comes together over the next several months. Um, you know, and yeah, the 1.1 1. 1 is, it's low. It's hard to work under that, absolutely. But that's also why safe harbor expires and you have to go about the process of getting an overhead rate that is approved and auditable right sure. so safe harbor is there to get you started it's not there to be forever and a fail safe to help you make money <laughs> okay i mean do you have any like suggestion you're you're a small business right when you started it you probably use safe harbor i mean mm -hmm. like and then you probably hire like accountant who understand that direct direct cost rate particularly yeah. with the far right mm -hmm. so that's another another problem with small business they can't afford that i mean it's just so expensive you know so i mean can you share i know that this is kind of like more personal <laughs> but i think that's really a little golden nuggets for our firms to learn you know how can i start you know as a and e you know so mm -hmm. yeah and i think that as far as that goes, so for me, I went and specifically sought out an accountant that understood FAR because the regulations are different and there's, you have to vet who your accountant is. If they don't understand it, it's not going to work in this world of, that we work in. Um, the other thing has been to work with the agencies that are approving your overhead rates and find out what is actually required for the paperwork. Because as a small business, you don't often have to actually have a full audited set of financials. Large businesses, absolutely. But for small businesses, you know, we've gotten away with, here's all of our records, here's how we do our bookkeeping, here's all the information that you need. And this is the justification for how we came up with our overhead rate. And it gets into the nitty gritties of what are we paying our um, people for their direct costs? What are we paying in all of our leases, our equipment, our um, software? I and mean, we track every dime that goes out because it does help us in getting that overhead rate and getting it approved. And we've gone through the audits. We've been through them with, I think, seven different agencies. We've never had a problem where an agency has come to me and said, we want you to go get an audited overhead rate. So for small businesses, there are ways to get an overhead rate approved without having to go through that very expensive audit. Um, okay, there was a question. What is the collaboration and change management choice by WashDOT? So, okay. <laughs> um, really, WashDOT lets the contractors choose what their system is. A lot of the contractors in Washington are using Procore. We've seen contractors use um, SharePoint. It's definitely not the preferred just because of the ways that you can't necessarily lock down things. Um, so I think every WashDOT project that we are currently working on, we are using Procore. And that just tends to be the system of choice at the moment. What else do you guys want to know? <laughs> so uh, Danica, you had mentioned to me that you were um, teaching can you tell us where you teach and the types of classes that you teach? 
Yeah. So generally we do teach marketing classes. Um, a lot of it is hired directly by various companies. And then we are working on um, teaching at a couple of different community colleges in other states. So we are not currently teaching at any schools here in Washington, but we do um, half day to full day marketing and um, business development classes for companies specifically that want to bring us in. So, and we've done those all over the country. We've done them with everything from um, professional services, so very specialized firms, to a &E firms, to large contractors. And that's really, so Red Team Go focuses mostly on marketing and business development. We do inclusion management and our, and utility coordination. But our main goal is really in this marketing and BD side for especially um, alternative delivery jobs. So we, we work a lot with both architects, um, engineers and contractors on CMGC, CMR, um, GCCM, as it's called in Washington, design build, progressive design build and P3 jobs. So in Washington, really it's design build. So our traditional design build, we're just starting to get into progressive design build. WashDOT awarded their first one last year, I think. And then um, GCCM. So Washington State does not have any statute that allows us to do P3 work at the moment. Uh, so are, are you affiliated or partnered with any um, uh, professional organizations, um, AGC, ABC, you know, those types of guys? Yeah, so we are partnered with ABC um, and then we are highly involved in like WTS is one of the organizations that we're extremely involved in. Um, we do get involved in SMPS. We, again, we try and focus a lot on the BD and marketing side, but um, we have always been open to working with other organizations as well. We do work with AGC quite a bit. And then we do a lot of work with Build Out, which is right now a California organization, but that is looking at going to be a national organization. So in Washington State, um, do you have connections with ABC uh, mm -hmm. Western Washington? I do. And, and ABC Inland Pacific? Uh, just Western Washington at the moment. Okay. The, the reason that I ask is that uh, we will be partnering with them mm -hmm. on some future projects um, similar to this, but it... Uh, <clears throat> Um, one will be Spokane, the other one will be in the Portland, uh, Southwest Washington area. Mm -hmm. So if you don't mind, I'll mention your name to them. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm always happy to have whatever conversations as well, Leslie, you know, so... Yeah, Danica, I'm, 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 I'm going to make it happen. I promise this with, you know, <laughs> I've been dying to have like all this, just focus on the design build more like super detailed, you know, not just at the service, you know, talk about mm -hmm. all the elements. And I think that's going to help our firms to understand, because like I said, you know, we work at the economic development with our clients, you know, with our mm -hmm. DBE folks. And we've seen a lot of like, failures you know when they get involved with the design build and I think education training is the key and you know have them like you know understand exactly like you know what kind of delivery that they're dealing with you know what I mean it's not just like bit bit and you get it and then you're like now what you know mm -hmm. so, well, like, and then listen, let me know if you need you know to team up too because like this is such a great opportunity I didn't see like a very comprehensive design build uh, focus, you know, training for our DBEs or SBEs, you know? Yeah. And I think the biggest thing is that 
you have to have patience when it comes to design build. Things don't happen automatically. It takes quite a bit of time to get in that door. Um, you can be on a team. You, you can have your bid in. You can not get engaged, depending on the size of the job, for three years. Because that's just when the design is finally done. For example, if you're a contractor. And that's hard because sitting on the bench or having people ready to go is not an easy thing for a small business. The base, like the best thing that you can do, especially if you're a small business, is open that communication and maintain that communication. If things change, you have to go talk to your upper tiers or to the primes and say, hey, look, this is going on. We either need to take on less or we can take on more or, you know, we need to know what your schedule is so that we can plan better. There's several ways to go about doing that to help keep from those failures. But I think the biggest failure that we do see is companies taking on more than they can handle. Yes, it's an opportunity for growth, but, you know, especially on, for example, a wash dot design build or a sound transit design build, if you take on a scope that is on the critical path and you can't deliver, you will have liquidated damages and they're not going to be forgiven just because you're a small business. You said you could deliver and then you don't and you're likely to get those LDs assessed on you. You know, and that's something that it does take a lot and you do, you know, especially on the contractor side, you have to be ready for you know, knowing if it's a PLA job or a CWA job or a CBA job, whatever you, you know, term the agency is using, you have to know what that means for you. You have to know, you know, if it's a PW or a PLA job or a CBA job, you have to pay prevailing wage. And if you're not prepared to do that, you better ramp up and be prepared to do it. <laughs> And you have to be prepared to sign that if you need additional labor, you're going through the halls. It's those little things that make a big difference. And I think that's really part of what John Salinas has been talking about as well, is knowing what that means for you and yeah. knowing what that means for your company. You know, yeah. it's not, you just decide to go do this. Um, if, for example, I can tell you, we just recently worked with a company where they were the low lowest responsible bidder on a sub package. Their native owned company, the project has no federal funding in it and they refuse to sign the PLA. So if it were a federally funded job, they wouldn't have to because it's a state funded job. They don't get the exemptions that they do on federally funded jobs. And so they ended up withdrawing their bid because they didn't want to sign the PLA and pay prevailing wage. See, that's so. the thing that they never learn. You know what I mean? Like, you never discuss. I mean, I just wonder sometimes in the pre-bid, not enough details, but it's just hard. You know, you go there, you mm -hmm. you present, you know, your project. And then do you have any question? They don't even know if those things are exist, right? Mm -hmm. We'll talk about the critical path. How many like A&E firms understand the real critical path. I mean, like that's the project management, you know, and you have to crash it, fast tracking it. I mean, they don't know. That's why education is really um, uh, uh, very important and, and, and very technical, you know what I mean? So it's like, sometimes it's really hard when we have the audience that have the level, you know, less advanced than the other one, but then, you know, but we have to be like fair when we present it. And then this is a great opportunity. We have a small group and you just, you know, spill all the beans here to us. And it's just <laughs> awesome, you know? I mean, I'm, I'm excited the, uh, to keep listening. Yeah. But the, the um, uh, prime was supposed to make sure that all sub consultants and contractors know what a critical path is in a very frequent way, maybe any monthly or two weeks, whatever they do. That's mm -hmm. the way I was taught. You know, we, you discuss it at your meeting, at your progress meeting, this article, or whatever it is. So they are very aware of it. So they can incorporate it into their own schedule. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think getting into what you were saying, Lily, like this information isn't shared at the pre-bids, but when the 
packages are put out, the contract is included and all that information is included in the contract. And it's the expectation of the primes that you're looking at the contract and know what those contract terms are. They're not going to break it down for you because these contracts, you know, if it's a wash dot contract, prime contract is huge. And knowing where to look in the contract and what you're looking for, that is something if you ask, you'll get the information, but it's really on every company to do their due diligence on knowing yeah. what that contract is. Yeah, but the schedule changes. It's, it's not static, it's dynamic. It changes every mm -hmm. single time and the yeah, physical part changes. So when that yeah. happens, it has to be communicated to the entire team because the, the whole team, subcontractors, sub, sub um, um, consultant, prime, they all want team. So they right. all should be matching up the same thing, yes. It is, yeah, and yeah, if you're under contract, that information is shared. If you're looking to get onto a team, it's shared, but it's not necessarily broken out in a, you know, this is a PLA job and we fall under this jurisdiction and this is what rule you're going to follow. And that's not typically laid out. That's something that it's provided to you but the primes don't sell it out for you necessarily. I agree with Victor. And I think sometimes it's the, you know, we have to have an accountability right, with subcontractor and Victor is co completely correct. And Victor, I really think that you are very savvy with that kind of stuff because you learn it and you understand your, your project manager, you know, you're part of the construction management. Some of the company, they just sign the contract, to be honest with you. <laughs> I, I, you know, I have a different hat before, you know, working as a technical <laughs> assistance folks, some DBE, they just signed a contract. They didn't even know what is in the contract. They didn't even look at the scope, like mm -hmm. detail, you know, and then again, with design build and G GCCM, such a complex, you know, delivery project. And then that's why I always try to be, like I said, I'm going to be a Debbie Downer, you know, for all these firms. <laughs> Do not bid on it unless you understand that. Just yeah. take your time, you know, and, you know, learn this from, you know, folks like Danica and everybody. Then when you're ready and then you go for it. But, you know, just take your time, do the training. Education is always the key. Talking to the prime contractor, you know, and you said communication, you know, first time you're doing the design build work, always talk, you know, maybe it just comes down like a pestering, but I think it's better to pester than, you know, you can't perform mm -hmm. and suddenly you <laughs> you get penalized. Yeah, and I think one of the big things, you know, kind of going back to that signing contracts without reading them is you have to have a lawyer look at your contracts. It's worth the money to have them look at it. And I can't tell you how many times my lawyers have said, hey, your prime said they have a code of ethics and this is where it's published, but we click on that link and there's no code of ethics there. It doesn't go anywhere. And the primes don't know that. And it's like, okay, well, even they're not reading their contracts necessarily because it's the boilerplate language. But it's well worth the couple hundred dollars to have a lawyer go through your contract versus signing something that you don't understand or that's not in your favor. So. Going back to the training, do you have recommendation for uh, any estimating um, training, especially refresher course, uh, courses for um, uh, highway construction and um, you know, something like that? Um, off the top of my head, I do not. But if you want to send me an email, I can absolutely send you some resources for that. Okay. All right. And Victor, try to reach out to SBTRC. I think last year we did direct indirect costs, and I think we we did it on demand. I mean, I'll talk to Aisha or Marnie, because remember Marnie when we did it last year, we have direct indirect costs. Um, I remember with the consultant, the accountant that you know, part of the Wash Dot group. Yeah, I can look up and see who the speaker was. Yeah, okay. I, I think. Yeah, I remember the lady, African American lady. I forgot what's her name. <laughs> she specialized on the direct, the indirect costs. Billy. 
Yes, he's awesome. No, he's not talking about indirect costs. He's talking about, I think he's talking about estimating when it comes to bidding on a project, a construction project, specifically bidding on a project or, um, or providing an engineer or estimate. providing an estimate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there are resources for that. I mean, the biggest thing and, um, you know, the contractors will tell you that they've got historical records of what pricing is on various pieces and portions. And um, that's a lot of what they go based off of is so just can their you, historical. Can you, can you do a request for information for that? Like, you know, like per unit, like, you know, seeing that pricing, I mean, is that something that we could ask? For like the uh, past project, it's already like similar, maybe like historically. You can get what the whatever is public record, but yeah. Primes are never going to give you access to their heavy bid software. I see. <laughs> um, that's just the reality. <laughs> you won't get access to that <laughs> because that's their proprietary information. Sure, sure, sure. So I definitely don't. I would never recommend calling a Prime and saying, "Hey, can you." want to share what your historical costs are for you know precast concrete they just won't <laughs> no no I think like I think you could ask for requests for information like with the agency I think if it, that's a public you know this information disclosure I think but I, I remember the lady's name is Palomino last name does it ring a bell Marnie no <laughs> <laughs> I think it's but I will, I will find her information she's a cpa so she does more as to uh and in, indirect and indirect cost estimate so uh she doesn't get into the estimating stuff but she okay. gets into okay. the accounting okay. practices a lot of uh, these state projects and federal projects too uh, so um you have to have certain kind of accounting systems in in place too so mm -hmm. okay yeah, and I think the other thing too to realize, you know, yes, you can go through and you can get what the bids are for all the various projects, right? Like you can go to Washcott's website and you can pull up the bids and the bid tabs. However, you're risking comparing apples to oranges. Prime contractors who do a lot of work, you know, you're talking, they're doing 20 times the volume of some of these subcontractors, their pricing is going to be better. You don't wanna base your price on something that someone else is getting for a different price because you may not be able to negotiate that. You don't have the negotiating power behind you. You don't have the buying power. You know, when you're buying more, your price tends to go down. When you're well-established, your price tends to go down. If you're trying to, follow what these big primes are doing your pricing is not going to be the same that's just the reality of it um, for a lot of these items and so i always caution looking at the bid tabs and then trying to create your own historical costing based on those because unless you've talked to the suppliers and you know what cost you're going to get for them that's not a good way to go about doing your bid that's awesome. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the other thing too, and you know, we've touched on this over the past few months. I know Lily is. Um, there are various goals for small business, disadvantaged business, um, women-owned, minority, veteran you know, there are goals on almost every job. It's not every single project, but depending on the agency, depending on where the funding is coming from, there are various goals. Being able to leverage falling into one of those categories is wonderful. It is not a reason to say, well, you need to hire me because I'll help you meet your women business goal. Not a reason. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a benefit yes it does help the prime they're not going to hire you just because you fit into one of those categories you still have to prove yourself you still have to have the qualifications I can't tell you how many times doing inclusion work I've been told well I'm 
certified as such and such. Therefore, I should just get a contract. Not how that works. <laughs> and I'm sure, George, you've heard the same thing working in this world. Yes, but I tell people first, <laughs> you got to be qualified. And, and then my own experience of life is that I always just say, if you're a minority, you have to be more qualified. I want you just part of life. So it may be, seem unfair, but you just try mm -hmm. to get the best qualification you can and you present that first. And it's added value to be certified. But I do say this, get certified. If you're a minority or woman-owned business and you're out there, and because it, even though a lot of these goals are voluntary, they still, um, I'll turn my picture on here. Uh, they're voluntary, but uh, still, uh, they want certification like I-405. You're not gonna, uh, they're looking for certified businesses, whether you're women or veteran or minority owned. So get certified, get your qualifications, get your certifications, mm -hmm. and then, you're, then you're better positioned. Absolutely. And then the other nice thing, if you're in the professional services realm, so in the A&E realm, more so than in the contractor's realm, working with primes who are multi-state, there may be opportunities for you to work in other states. That may mean that you can look at projects that are in you know, Idaho, Oregon, California, know what the requirements are, know if you have to have a DIR number, for example, in California, know if you need to go get your PE license, if you need to stamp something, but a lot of the time, especially now, because so much of the work is remote, you don't have to be in that state to work. That is the one good thing right now that has come out of what we've been dealing with for the past year and a half. We're getting used to remote work. And if you really can prove that you can do the work, you deliver, you're good at what you do, there become opportunities to go outside of the geographic area that you've worked in previously. And so a big piece of that though, is you have to know what you need to have in order to work in those states and what the implications are of working in them. So, and that's one where lawyers and accountants are your best friends. <laughs> I would never tell you to go do it on your own. Um, it's just, you know, and talking to the prime. So they'll help you know what you need to have as well. Some of the resources like PTAC and MBDA and, and uh, SBTRC, you know, they, they help with some of that with maybe they provide a lawyer that paid for the first hour or two or something. But um, as I've heard a person say in one of these networking events, that the best way is if you pay uh, for the service, you're gonna get a better service. Now that's, mm -hmm. that's a quote, that's a statement. That's not always the case. <laughs> so as Washington PTAC, uh, Marnie and I you know, would like to refute that. Um, we have such excellent counselors in Washington state uh, the majority are retired federal contracting officers that know the ins and outs of mm -hmm. everything, you know, from the Department of Agriculture to the, you know, Naval Warfare Center. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the saying also goes, you know, don't pay for what you can get for free. So Washington PTAC is funded uh, in part by the Department of Defense. And then our partner agencies, our economic development agencies and universities. And, and you know, we're very, very selective on uh, the personnel that, that we bring on board for Washington PTAC. Um, you know, we look for um, customer service, you know, is, is a criteria and, you know, knowledge and ability and, and, you know, how to put together an event and how to teach, you know, in front of a class and, and, um, you know, PTAC 
is probably one of the best kept secrets around. And uh, if you ever need any assistance at all, you know, it, it may take a little bit to find your exact PTAC that will work with you, you know, with your particular needs. But, you know, I, I tried to retire in 2015 and, and then I tried to retire in 2016. And in 2019, I, I came back and I'm still not retired. But I, you know, I, I really think that um, this, the services that, that are available to you through MBDA, SBTRC, PTAC, um, yeah, we, we have the inside track on a lot of stuff. And you know, resources like what we're doing today and bringing Danica and Lily and Lisa on board today, you know, has been uh, an incredible resource. Yeah, you know, there's like a million other questions and, and I know how this happens. You know, Danica can give us a 30,000 foot flyover, but sometimes you need very specific guidance and things. And, you know, that's the key to your resources is, you know, Danica will talk to you or Lily will talk to you and, and PTAC will always talk to you. And, you know, we, we really try to do uh, the very best job because if for no other reason, uh, some of us are accountable to Uncle Sam for our deliverables. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so, yeah, we, we have to deliver on, on what uh, we're tasked to do. So, um, Dan, yeah, I think that, that statement that the person that made, because I heard this the network event, hey, they, I did refute some of that anyway. But what it was, I think, particularly with WASDOT, they have DBE support services. It gets funded, then it gets unfunded, runs out of funds, then it gets funded again, then it runs out of funds. Mm -hmm. Whereas to me, PTAC and, and the others, they've been around and consistently been around. And so I think this person had more experience with the start, stop, start, stop. Yeah. Situation. Yeah. Well, and, and you know, in uh, my own personal history, um, yeah, I, I've done a lot of hand holding for PTAC, you know, trying to get them over everything from technical challenges to, you know, submitting the bid and then you know, getting a debrief or, you know, performing things. And, and yeah, you know, we're, we're here from step one to finish. And, and I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned that, George, it uh, just gave me a, a moment to get on our soapbox here about PTAC and all the other really great resources. So um, do we have any more questions for Danica? Um, I did put her contact information in the chat if you want to uh, connect with her personally. And um, I, I would also like to recognize again, Lily Keith and uh, Lisa Fair from Spokane Transit, or not Spokane, Seattle Transit. <laughs> can, can you tell I'm from the Spokane area? <laughs> uh, but with that, um, Thank you, Danica, again. Absolutely. And, and I'd like to uh, turn this over to Aisha to, to maybe say a word or two, and uh, we'll just keep moving on. So Aisha. Yeah, thank you all for being here today. Um, kind of just going to echo off of what um, Leslie just said. Thank you all for, for being here and for um, interacting with us today. Honestly, I think this has been probably my favorite session we've had so far. Um, very informative um, and just amazing questions and synergy. And, and so I uh, wanted to thank you all for that. Okay, so with that- and, uh, George, this is Victor Metu. I did, I did leave you a message um, two days ago. Please uh, search for it and respond, please. Oh, okay, you said the George at gwfrost.com? Yes. Okay, I'll look for that. I, I'll look at spam. I forgot about spam. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> yes. 
Okay, well, I, I think we'll call it a day. We're a little bit early, but um, thank you all so much. And hopefully you'll come back and join us on uh, Thursday for the goods and services session. And we're gonna have some really great topics on Thursday. So uh, thank you all for joining us and, and we'll see you next time.